Hi, I'm out on the range to which we have exclusive access, and today is a windy day. Of course we have a wind sock over the mic, but it can only do so much. And things like wind are one of the realities of actually being outside demonstrating things as opposed to being in your mom's basement playing with your joystick. Now recently I did a presentation on the subject of which is faster and or more practical, reloading your long arm or transitioning to your handgun. What types of firearms might facilitate doing one or the other, what types of situations, what goals you might have that might affect that. And that presentation was an unmitigated disaster. And it was because of certain things I failed to do. Now what actually happened was the comments section was overwhelmed by people making ridiculous, inane commentary. This runs the gamut from people writing things that they thought would be funny but missing the mark by a wide margin, to people writing things that they thought would demonstrate their very high level of knowledge on firearms and their use, while what they actually demonstrated was the depths of their ignorance to people accusing me of making fraudulent demonstrations. It was terrible, and I had to delete the presentation. Now, why did that happen on this particular presentation? Well, there have been several things offered to explain it. One of the crew told me that when that aired, Mercury was in retrograde, and that could have something to do with it, and maybe it does, but there are other factors as well. The factors that I think really affected it was my failure to do several things. Now, let me back up and explain something. I get a lot of criticisms about a lot of things, such as the nature of this type of work. There's people who don't like my hair, who don't like my jacket, who don't like the sound of my voice, and so on and so forth. There's people who don't like the meat target and say it's a worthless test medium and so forth. Okay. But the two biggest criticisms I get are, one, that I'm long-winded. I'm demonstrating that right now. There are people who will say that every time I try to explain anything, I go back to the dawn of time. There are people who will describe me as someone who, if you ask me what time it is, I'll give you a 20-minute dissertation on how to build a clock. Such observations are not without merit. Now, the second criticism that I get a lot is that I will say and do things just to pander to the troll crowd, just to try to prevent nonsensical commentary. And people say that I should not waste the viewer's time doing those things. Okay. Unfortunately, both of those things are absolutely necessary. And I forgot that in that recent presentation and decided not to do Dawn of Time explanations, relying on the audience to have enough intellect to understand what I was talking about. And most of you do. Some demonstrated that they do not. I also have to point out that presentations like this, although I try to keep them family friendly, they really are made for adults. And this presentation caught the attention of a lot of people who were not. And of course, many people have different definitions of what the term adult means. My definition is not solely based on the number of birthdays you've had. If you're 25 years old and still living in your mom's basement and the only meaningful contact you have with other people is via playing video games online, your status as an adult becomes, in my opinion, highly questionable. But because of my failure to do Dawn of Time explanations and my failure to make certain comments to alleviate some of the troll commentary, we were inundated with such things. A good example is this. The concept of transitioning from a long arm to a handgun, when should you do it, under what conditions should you do it, is a discussion that goes back many generations. It has very real, real-world application for police officers, military personnel, citizens who are concerned with self-defense, for hunters. It is a discussion that I have heard people have. It's a discussion that I've participated in many times over a period of decades. However, it's also a video game meme. 
and not wanting to do a dawn of time explanation and pander to the children who might make silly commentary i left that out i didn't think it was necessary to bore the audience with the video game references and i was wrong to leave that out and what it led to was hundreds of comments that were slight variations on the same thing which was remember it's always faster to transition to your handgun than reload When you're one of the first three or four people to make that comment, it's almost interesting. By the time you are the 100th person to make essentially the same comment, it tells me a few things about you, such as you're not very observant that you didn't notice 99 people had already made the comment. You're also not very imaginative. It becomes trite, derivative, and boring. And all of those comments, that one and something about chopping up a watermelon, flooded the comments section because I failed to do a dawn of time explanation and failed to head that off before it happened. We also ran into problems where I demonstrated some firearms that I thought did not require dawn of time explanations as to how they work, such as a double-barreled shotgun. Unfortunately, I was then inundated with comments from people telling me that I was faking something. No. People telling me that my shotgun was defective. People telling me that I wasn't using it correctly. Because I failed to demonstrate from the standpoint of starting at the dawn of time. And these failures on my part created the need for a part two to transitioning from a long arm to a handgun that will clear up some of the things from part one. So after this dawn of time explanation, let me show you a couple of things. In part one, there was a very brief discussion from an historical standpoint where I talked about the concept of transitioning from your long arm to your sidearm being something that goes back to the days of muzzle-loading firearms. And to help illustrate my point, I displayed this firearm. This is made by Thompson Center. It's 54 caliber, and it is a Hawken rifle, H-A-W-K-E-N. That's what's printed on the barrel, that's what it is, and that's what I very clearly said. But that did not stop some people from referring to it in the commentary as a Hawkins rifle. No, it is a Hawkins rifle. And despite my tendency to sometimes trip over words, I did not trip over any words in that case. But let's move on. Now, from the historical perspective, just talking about muzzle-loading firearms, I was trying to make a point that transitioning from your muzzle-loading rifle to a single-shot muzzle-loading pistol might not have been all that practical because a lot of muzzle-loading pistols are fairly big and bulky and it's a lot of weight to carry to just get one extra shot. But I made two crucial mistakes. One, I did not display a single-shot muzzle-loading pistol. I mistakenly thought I didn't need to. And two, I didn't do a dawn of time explanation. So let's correct that now. Here's a single-shot muzzle-loading pistol. It's 45 caliber. Some would be smaller, some might be much larger, but this is typical. And when you're talking about muzzle-loading firearms, transitioning to this single-shot pistol, depending on the situation, may not be any more practical than transitioning to your tomahawk. Now, I have a couple of presentations on throwing tomahawks. We're not going to throw this today. You can watch those presentations for a more in-depth example. But which of these two would be more practical would depend on several factors. Also in part one, there were a few times where I said what you do might depend on several factors, and that seemed to fall upon deaf ears. So let me see if I can make that more clear now. Which one you would transition to could be dependent on many factors. Those factors would include, but not be limited to, things like how good of a shot are you with your pistol? And with only one shot, how many targets are there? Also, what are those targets? And are they moving toward you, moving away from you? And many other things, many other things could influence what you do. But the real point I was trying to make was 
the, the whole discussion of transitioning from your long arm to your side arm becomes something of practical discussion when the world moved away from single shot most loading pistols and started adopting cap and ball revolvers. Let's take a look. In discussing the transition from a muzzle-loading rifle to a cap and ball revolver, I said words to the effect of, when you transition to the revolver, you will quite often be giving away a significant amount of ballistic power and a significant amount of long-range accuracy. However, when you transition from a single-shot muzzle-loading rifle to a cap and ball revolver with six rounds, depending on the situation, that can be a real game-changer. And that's where things in the presentation really started to go to pieces. I was inundated with comments from people who obviously know a lot more about muzzle-loading arms than I do, telling me that, no, Paul, that's not right. You wouldn't have six rounds. You'd only have five, because no one would ever carry this revolver loaded with six. You would never load a cap and ball revolver with six rounds. You'd always keep your hammer down on an empty chamber for safety. Really. Okay, I'm not going to shoot this revolver today because we already have several excruciatingly tedious presentations on how cap and ball revolvers work, how they're loaded, how they're fired, their power, their effectiveness, their accuracy. But when it comes to the concept of whether you'd load it with five or six, I will explain a little bit about how this revolver works. Unfortunately, to do that, I have to start with explaining how this revolver works. Let's take a close-up look. This is a Colt single-action army revolver. Let me show you how it works. Pull the hammer back to half cock and that freewheels the cylinder. Open the loading gate and then load in one round at a time, rotating the cylinder as you do. It has a six-shot cylinder. Once you get all six rounds in, then you'll snap the loading gate shut and lower the hammer. However, there's a problem with doing that. This hammer-mounted firing pin, when put to its most forward position, is resting against the primer of that live round. If you were to drop this and you were to hit that hammer hard enough, it could go off. So what is typically done is the revolver is loaded with five rounds and that empty chamber is rotated so that the hammer is resting on an empty chamber for safety. It's a six-shot revolver that is very typically carried with five rounds. However, that is not how cap and ball revolvers work. Let me show you a close-up. This is a Ruger Old Army cap and ball revolver. Put it on half cock and it will freewheel the cylinder and you can see that it's a six shot cylinder that has all six chambers capped with percussion caps. You can also see that between the chambers are these notches. Those notches have a purpose. This revolver is designed to be loaded with all six rounds and then you line that notch up, lower your hammer into the notch between two chambers, and stick it in your holster. That hammer is resting on the notch, not a percussion cap. That is absolutely safe, and that is the way it is designed to be carried. Let me show you another cap and ball revolver. Here's an Italian-made replica of a Remington Model 1858, and it is true to the original design in most ways, the one big exception being that it has adjustable sights the original would not have. Put the hammer on half cock, rotate the cylinder, and you can see that the six-shot cylinder has all six chambers capped, and you can see that, like the old army, there are notches between all of the chambers. This revolver is designed to have all six chambers loaded, lower the hammer between two loaded chambers, and it's absolutely safe, and it can safely be carried with all six chambers loaded. So when someone makes the statement that no one would carry a revolver like this loaded with six, they are actually partially correct. I am a nobody, and I carry my revolver loaded with six. When it comes to cap and ball revolvers, I'm sure there are some exceptions somewhere, but every cap and ball revolver that I have ever seen has some kind of notch or nub between the chambers meant as a resting place for the hammer so it can safely be carried with six. Now here's where I have to say something that I really don't like saying. I purchased this particular revolver with my paper route money long before I was old enough to drive. Yes, they had cars back then. Did you really think that in owning this revolver for all this time that I've never learned how it works? 
Now on the subject of people making commentary that really demonstrated that they had a complete ignorance as to how things work, let me show you something else. This is a Stoger Uplander side-by-side -side, double barreled 20 gauge shotgun. And in part one I use this to demonstrate the point that although double barreled shotguns have some good features, rapid reloading is not among them. And I was trying to make the point that if you were bird hunting and you shoot those two shots, transitioning to your handgun isn't a good idea. But in a home defense situation, if you shot your two shots and had not resolved the problem, then instead of taking the time to reload your double barrel, you may be better served by just dropping it and going to a handgun. Now, I thought I made that point clear. Unfortunately, I was inundated by commentary from people who were accusing me of misrepresenting how the gun worked. And there were people who were telling me that the demonstration was invalid because they were accusing me of using a defective gun. No, this gun is not defective, and I certainly was not misrepresenting how it worked. But it became obvious that the way they thought this gun worked and the way it really works are two different things. So now we have to have a dawn of time explanation. This is a double-barreled shotgun that does not have exposed hammers. You push this lever to the side, and when you open it, sometimes some force is required in opening it because you are compressing the springs to cock the internal hammers. Now, once it's opened, you load it with two shot shells. Very simple gun to operate. To fire it, you disengage the safety, then pull the front trigger to shoot the right barrel, the rear trigger to shoot the left barrel. You don't have to do it in that order, you can pull either trigger. To reload, push your lever to the side, open it again, that will automatically engage your safety. Then you have to pull out your empty shells, get rid of them, reach in and get two more, and load it again. Really a very simple gun to operate. But people were telling me that I was operating it incorrectly or that the gun was defective? Okay, let me explain a little bit about how shotguns work. There are many different types of shotguns. There's pump shotguns, auto loaders, there's even bolt action shotguns. But this particular one is in the category of what's called break action. It breaks open. Now when it comes to break action shotguns, there's an amazing variety. I've even seen four barrel shotguns. But here in the United States, if we're talking about break action shotguns, the vast majority of them will be single shot or double barrel. Most shotguns, when you break them open, they have an extractor, which will pull that shell out just a little bit so you can get it out. Some are equipped with something called an auto ejector. When you break that gun open, an auto ejector will flip that round out of there for you so you don't have to take it out, and you can just put another round in really decreases loading time. That feature is common on single shot shotguns. They don't all have it, but a lot of them do. A lot of double barrels do not have that feature. Some double barrels do. If you go to the skeet range and you see a lot of high dollar skeet guns, especially over and under shotguns that are really made for shooting skeet, auto ejectors are pretty common. And auto ejectors on doubles can be pretty cool because, again, not all, but most of them will have a selector so that if you only shoot one shot and then you go to reload, it'll only pop out the one that you've shot. It can be a great feature. However, although that feature exists, when you're talking about moderately priced, side-by-side, double-barreled hunting shotguns, most of them do not have auto ejectors. This doesn't have auto ejectors. I was not misrepresenting how it worked. It's not defective. It just doesn't have auto ejectors. Most moderately priced, side-by-side, double-barreled hunting shotguns don't have auto ejectors. This one does not. This Rossi coach gun does not have auto ejectors. This Remington double barrel does not have auto ejectors. Although some double barrels do have auto ejectors, the majority of moderately priced, side-by-side, double-barreled hunting shotguns don't. So, no, my Stoger Uplander 20-gauge shotgun is not defective, and in no way was I misrepresenting how it worked. But that brings up the question, if it's not defective, and I wasn't misrepresenting it, 
why were there so many people who thought that that was the case? And why were there so many people who thought that they knew how double-barreled shotguns work while they were demonstrating that they knew very little about the subject? The best explanation I can come up with is that that presentation captured the attention of a lot of new viewers, and a lot of those viewers thought that they had a great deal of knowledge about how double-barreled shotguns work, but the sources of that knowledge were what they had seen in the cinema and what they had experienced playing video games. Their sources did not include actually being in the field and really shooting real guns. Now another problem that I had in the demonstration with this shotgun was people who were accusing me of using it improperly. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. When demonstrating my Stoger Uplander shotgun, I fired two rounds, opened the chambers, got those two rounds out, and then reloaded with two more rounds. Seems like a pretty basic operation. But there were a lot of people telling me that I was doing it wrong. And they were discussing two different techniques. One is called dumping the shells, the other is called shucking, shucking the shells. And I'll see if I can demonstrate both of those. Now, in dumping the shells, the concept is that when you fire your two rounds, instead of just opening it and pulling those two rounds out, you'll point the muzzle vertically while you're opening, and gravity will allow those shells to just fall out. So, after you fired your two, you'll turn it, open it, and those shells will fall out. Now, that seems to make a lot of sense, and sometimes you'll see people successfully using that technique. However, there's a little bit that goes to it. Not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, when people are doing that, they're using a modified shotgun, typically modified by honing the chambers, and or they're using very light shot loads. Whether we're talking about center fire pistol ammunition, center fire rifle ammunition, or shotgun ammunition, some expansion occurs in the chamber when you fire that round. And so although live rounds will fall right out, empty casings might not, especially when you're using a shotgun that hasn't been modified and you're using full power hunting ammunition. So let's try this dumping the shell technique when I load with full power hunting ammunition, which in this case is 20 gauge, three inch, one and a quarter ounce of number five lead bird shot. And we can see no, they didn't just fall right out. They're not difficult to get out, but they don't fall right out. However, those are full power rounds in a non-modified gun. What if I were to use some really light loads? In this case, 20 gauge, two and three quarter inch, low base, seven eighths ounce of bird shot. Let's see if I can dump these. No, it doesn't work. Now, the other technique is something called shucking the shells. And the idea is you fire your two, open it like this, move the shotgun rearward very fast to an immediate stop. And the inertia of those moving shells will continue and it'll throw them out of the chamber. Again, you can see people doing that successfully. You may have seen me doing that successfully on a presentation we did quite a while ago but that was using a modified gun with light loads, not a non-modified gun with full power ammunition. So let's try shucking the shells loaded with some full power ammo. Well, I got one out. The other, not quite so easy. Let's try that using our really light loads. Again, low base, two and three quarter inch, seven eighths ounce of shot. Well, still I got one out, the other one this time. Maybe if I were to shuck it harder, it would have worked. But that's just this gun. Let's try this with a different shotgun. Now I have my 12 gauge Rossi coach gun, and let's try our dumping and our shucking drills with this. And we'll start with full power hunting ammunition, which in this case is Remington 12 gauge, two and three quarter inch, one and a quarter ounce of number four lead bird shot. No! Actually, this gun, the shells can be difficult to get out. But let's now try that with our low base Winchester 
one ounce of number seven and a half lead bird shot. No. Let's try shucking it. We'll go back to our full power ammunition. No. Okay, one more try with our low base Winchester one ounce of number seven and a half bird shot. No! Well, shucky darns. Let's try one more gun. Now this 12 gauge double barreled shotgun is marked Remington. And let's see how it works with our dump and our shucking drills. And again, we'll start with our full power ammunition, which is Remington 12 gauge, two and three quarter inch, one and a quarter ounce of number four lead bird shot. Hey, they fell out. Well, how about that? <laughs> That was impressive. Now let's try shucking them with our full power ammunition. You should have seen the look on the camera operator's face when that happened. Well, they didn't shuck out. That might be my fault. But let's try shucking them with our low base, low powered one ounce of number seven and a half bird shot. Well, almost. Maybe if I did that a little better, it might work. And it worked. So we see that these techniques do work sometimes with some guns. So in part one, when I was demonstrating the Stoger Uplander shotgun, I did not use the dumping technique, I did not use the shucking technique, because those techniques don't really work with this shotgun, especially when it's loaded with full power hunting ammunition, which in fact was what I was using. We also see that with today's demonstration, that when you're talking about moderately priced, side-by-side, double-barreled hunting shotguns that have not been modified, the dumping or shucking technique quite often does not work. However, we also saw today that depending on the gun and the ammunition, sometimes it does work. And I was trying to explain that to one person in particular in the comments, saying that those techniques don't work with all guns and all ammunition, and he assured me that those techniques work, quote, in all cases, close quote. And that is a really big indicator that you're dealing with somebody who does not know very much about guns or shooting is when they use words like always or never or phrases like in all cases. Now we have to have a discussion about my A1 platform rifle. I've used this for many demonstrations in many presentations and on several occasions I have said this is an A1 platform rifle. It has A2 handguards on it, but it's an A1 platform. However, in part one of today's presentation, I did not say that. And it's not that I forgot to, but it wasn't really germane to the points I was trying to make, and I was trying to avoid doing the dawn of time explanations. However, by not doing the dawn of time explanation, it created the opportunity for many people to make many erroneous comments talking about my A2 rifle. And when I say this, I am not trying to insult anyone, but there was one person in particular who talked about how seeing me shoot this A2 rifle reminded him of when he was in basic training with an A2 rifle. Well, no, sorry, this is an A1. And although the platforms are similar, there's a lot of differences. Now, let's take a close-up look at this A1. At the top of your screen is the A1 platform, at the bottom of your screen the A2 platform. There are many differences between these two rifles, but I want to discuss just the visual differences that make it easy to tell the difference when you're looking at them. If we start at the front of these, we can see that the A1's flash suppressor is a little different than the A2's. We also see the glaring difference that the A2 barrel is much thicker than the A1's. Come back here, we can see that the A2 has a left-hand brass deflector that the A1 does not have. We can see that the forward assists on both rifles look very different. One big thing that's easy to see is the rear sight assembly. The A1 adjusts for windage with this wheel that you use the point of a round to move. The A2 has 
a thumb and finger knob to adjust windage. The A2 also has an elevation knob, the A1 does not. You can also see a difference in the pistol grip. The A2 has a thicker, bigger pistol grip that has this addition of this little piece here. Although the two rifles are similar, there are some very big differences that make it easy to tell the difference when you're looking at them. And these differences are, in my opinion, obvious to anyone that's familiar with these platforms. In addition to a lot of people thinking that my A1 was actually an A2, there were also a lot of people who took umbrage to my sling. The type of sling I have, the length to which I have it adjusted, and so on. There were people complaining that I have the sling too tight, and so instead of having to set the rifle down when I transition to the handgun, I should be able to sling it over my back, which you can see doesn't really work with the sling adjusted to this length. There were people who were telling me that I should use a two-point sling or a one-point sling. And there was a disturbingly high number of people who seemed to take great offense to me using what they called a parade sling. Okay. I know definitions can change over the years, but when I went to basic training, a tight parade sling did not refer to the type of sling you were using, it referred to how it was attached to the rifle. You adjusted it so that it was tight along the side of the rifle so it didn't get in the way when you were doing close order drill, and that was a tight parade sling. Anybody else remember that term? All right. There are reasons why I have this type of sling and have it adjusted to this length. Let me see if I can demonstrate some of them. I have two targets set up and I'll shoot these with my A1 platform rifle from a distance of 200 yards. When we talk about shooting offhand, that does not mean using your non-dominant hand. It means shooting from a standing, unsupported position. And some people, when they shoot offhand, will incorporate the sling into that. And they'll put their arm through it, grab their hand guards, and that can, for some people, make them a little more stable. I've tried it. It really doesn't help me shoot any better offhand. When I shoot offhand, I'm just going to let the sling dangle. However, in shooting from the prone, there are ways to incorporate the sling into that that for many people can help them shoot more accurately. You can detach the sling, turn it a half turn, put your arm through it. But there's also something called a hasty sling. That's where you already have the sling set at the right length, and when you get into the prone, put your arm through, back around, grab your hand guards, and that can lock a lot of people into a more stable position. But how much more accurate will it be for me? Well, I've got the two targets set up at 200. I'll shoot the one on the left from the prone without using the sling, the one on the right from the prone using the sling, and we'll see how the groups compare. But I'm going to start the drill from standing and make getting into the position part of the drill. And so we'll also compare how much more time does it take to use the hasty sling. And remember, in both cases, I'm going to shoot as fast as I think I can hit. So we'll start without using the sling. Now we'll do that incorporating the sling into the drill. Now let's go take a look at the targets. Okay, the cloudburst didn't hit until after I was done firing, so the targets were flat when I was shooting at them. I fired eight shots at each target. I've got the shot holes covered with the red pasties so they're easier to see. This is not a shot hole, that's where a staple tore through. So on this target, shooting without the sling, 
we see of eight shots, there's only seven hits. Some of them are not particularly good hits. This target, using the sling, all eight shots are on the paper and they are significantly better hits. Now it did take longer to get into this position, but was it enough of a delay to really matter? And was that delay worth getting much better results on paper? I would say for me, yes. So whether I'm on a range shooting paper targets or in the field shooting targets with a little more consequence, this sling set up like this allows me to more effectively hit what I'm shooting at. But what about the one and two point slings? Let's take a look at a couple of them. This is my Ruger AR556, it's an AR platform pistol. Yes, it's 100% legal in this jurisdiction. And it has a one point sling attached to it. Now I'm gonna take this sling and I'll put my arm and my head through it. And I'll put it on here and I'll get it adjusted, get it all situated. And it hangs like that, or I can move that around back. Now, when people saw me demonstrating my transition using this rifle with this sling, a lot of people seemed to think that I wasn't using a one-point sling because of my ignorance to their existence. Did you really think that I had never seen one of these? Of course I've heard of them. I own a couple of them. I just choose not to use them, and there's some reasons for that. Now, explaining those reasons starts with the disclaimer that in no way am I trying to tell you what you should do or what kind of equipment you should have or how you should use that equipment. But I am going to show you some of the equipment I have and how I use it and why. Now, slings like this, depending on the shooter, the firearm, the environment, and the task at hand, these can be great pieces of equipment. But for this shooter, in the environment in which I typically operate, with the firearms I typically use, for the tasks that I'm typically trying to accomplish, I don't like using these. Now let me see if I can explain that. First of all, you can see that this just hangs here, hands-free, that's great, it's very rapid deployment. Not only that, if I want to go down to a kneeling position, I can do that without this sling getting in the way. Same goes for a prone position. In bringing the rifle to bear, if I have a sling like this, point like this, and I do some kind of thing like this to get the rifle into action, for many people, this is going to be a lot faster. Now, when we're talking about transitioning from one firearm to the other, if I'm using this and I have to transition very quickly because this has become unusable due to a malfunction that I can't immediately clear or because it's out of ammunition and I need to shoot faster than I can reload this, I can just drop this and go to the pistol and unless I need to get down to a kneeling or a prone position where this will be in the way, it's going to work just fine and I won't have lost the firearm when I do it. As we're making the transition with this, I either have to just drop the rifle and lose it, or I have to sling it, which is going to be time consuming and then it's gonna get in my way when I'm trying to shoot my pistol. So with this giving me so many different advantages, why would I choose not to use it? First of all, because this is not the firearm I typically use. This one is, and there's some reasons for that. Primarily two. One, the longer barrel will produce more power with the same ammunition than the shorter barrel will. And two, I can shoot this platform more accurately than I can shoot this platform. So if this is the firearm that I'm typically going to use, a sling like this for me becomes contraindicated for several reasons. One, you see how this is hanging here? Okay, if I were to hang my full length rifle at about the same place, the muzzle is dragging in the dirt. Not exactly a good idea. Another reason is just simply that I find this to be uncomfortable. Although it can be practical for a lot of people, and I've tried this in many different ways, I just don't like it. The other reason is that even though this will not get in my way when I go down to a prone position, this type of sling does not allow me to put my arm through it and get that locked in 
solid position that will allow me to shoot more accurately from the prone. Now there's one other reason that I dislike this type of sling. Let me show you what I mean. What if I were working around buildings or containers or large vehicles and I was using this type of sling and I had to come around this corner? Let's take a look. I can do that without exposing very much of myself. But what if I were coming around the same corner with this rifle and this type of sling? You see that I can still do it without exposing very much of myself. So going around this type of corner doesn't make much difference. But what if I was going around the other corner of this building? Let's take a look at that. Which direction I'm going around a corner matters because I typically shoot right-handed. So going around the other corner, I was okay. But coming around this corner, I'll end up exposing a lot of myself. So before I come around this corner, I'm going to transition to shooting left-handed. And I can come around the corner exposing relatively little of myself. But that's with this rifle and this sling just hanging here. What about with the one-point sling? Let's put that to the test. This one-point sling is great for shooting right-handed. But when I come around this corner, as we've seen, shooting right-handed exposes a lot of me. So I'm going to want to make the transition to left-handed. And when I do that, this thing always manages to, in one of several ways, get in the way. And it's very difficult for me to make that transition. Other people may be better at it than I am, but that's a problem I have. Now there's a couple of different schools of thought on going around this kind of corner. And remember, there are 27 ways to skin a cat. Some people are of the opinion that if you're shooting from your dominant side, you're going to be far more accurate than shooting from your non-dominant side. Therefore, coming around a corner like this, I should shoot right-handed, and that takes precedence over the exposure that I get. I do not agree with that opinion. I think cover is very important, and you should just learn to shoot with your non-dominant hand. So when I come around this corner, I'm going to want to do it left-handed. And this sling just makes that transition awkward. So a sling like this one can, for some people under some conditions, be a great piece of equipment. But as far as what I'm going to use, my opinions are based on my education, my training, my experiences. And after 20 years of being in the military, doing a lot of military training, a lot of military operations, a lot of live fire training, a lot of live fire ranges, doing a lot of mount exercises, doing a lot of hunting, I can tell you that this sling is not the right sling for me. Another topic that caused some people to have great distress and other people to have tantrums was this suspenders belt and holster rig that I use. There was all kinds of comments about how all real professionals carry their pistol on their right hip and nobody carries a low slung leg holster anymore and other such nonsense. Okay, let me see if I can explain why I use this setup. And it comes with one very big caveat, and that is this. Although I try to keep these presentations family friendly, they really are intended for adults. If you're still in preschool, I cannot adequately explain things on your level. But if you have advanced at least enough to be in grade school, I think I can put things in terms you'll understand. And the first thing you need to understand is that this is not a concealed carry rig. It's made for use out here in the field where I have no need of concealed carry. Now, once you can absorb that, then maybe you can understand the rest of it. There are reasons why I carry a low-slung holster instead of one up here on the belt, and there are reasons why I use this particular holster. Let me see if I can show you some of them. One of the reasons for a setup like this is for use while driving. When I get into the Jeep, which is my daily driver, and I put on my seat belt, you can see that it doesn't get in the way of the holster. I can still easily reach my pistol. If the holster were higher on my hip, because that's where all real professionals carry their pistol, the seat belt would be in the way of this. So for everyone telling me that this holster is wrong and so forth, 
are you really saying that none of you thought of this? Well, I have, and that's one of the reasons I use this type of holster. Let me show you another reason. Another reason for the holster being this low is that I am of the opinion that when you reach for your pistol, if you actually have to reach down, then the holster's too low. But you can see that this is just the right level for the length of my arm. So when I reach down and disengage the thumb brake, I can bring the pistol to bear fairly quickly. But would that be negatively affected if the holster were up on my belt? Let me show you something. Now I have my Colt government model in a rigid polymer holster that's up on the belt. And so now when I reach for my pistol, you can see that I can still do it fairly quickly. So what's the problem? The problem is this. I do strenuous physical exercise five days a week and I'm in relatively good physical condition. However, over the years, I've injured this shoulder a few times, and I find that reaching down and pulling out a pistol from here is far more comfortable for me than reaching up and having to pull it really high. So although I can do it, I find it uncomfortable to do so, and I will avoid that if I can. And I can avoid that by using a lower slung holster. Now, when I say that, a lot of people will say something to the effect of, oh, I didn't know. That's right, you didn't. And so rather than exhibiting Dunning-Kruger, maybe you should stop and think a little bit about what you don't know before you try to tell me that I'm using the wrong holster. Now, another thing about this type of holster is it's rigid polymer and it holds this 1911 platform very securely, but that's the only pistol that it will hold is a 1911 platform. The other holster I use is more versatile. Let me show you what I mean. Now there's one more thing I want to show you about this holster. We've seen that it has a thumb brake, but that thumb brake piece is held on with Velcro. That and the fact that the holster isn't really rigid makes it versatile. So I can use it to hold my Beretta 92FS or my Colt government model or my Steyr GB or my Ruger Security 6 or my SIG P229 or the Smith & Wesson Model 59. Having a holster that's this versatile is very convenient and that's one of the reasons that I use it. Now I could go on, but I really don't want to. I really did not want to go on this long. I really did not want to waste your time explaining things like this. Unfortunately, sometimes I have to. And I think I've made my point. So as always, don't try this at home on what you call a professional. And do me a favor, educate yourself on firearms and their use. And when you do so, use sources other than video games and put a little bit of effort into actually knowing what you're talking about before you try to explain my firearms to me.